I'm so glad to be with you again and you get to be with me here in my living room. I'm so happy to have you here and to get to just talk about Jesus and we're back at the cross. This is part four and so exciting as we've talked about so far. Part one, we talked about how that Jesus used the cross to redeem us from the curse into the blessing. We talked about the passion of the Christ, Jesus' death and his resurrection. Oh my goodness, how glorious. And then we've talked about part three being blood speaks in the courtroom of God's justice and his law. The blood of our counselor, Jesus, is speaking mercy. Even though the blood, even though the adversary, the accuser of the brethren, Satan, is constantly accusing us and trying to even get inside our head and make us feel like we're less than a worm, he's the one that's under the curse. We are under the law of blessing in Christ Jesus. So today, in this, this part, let's talk about the strategic suffering of Jesus. Now, I know that doesn't sound like a great topic, but oh my goodness, as you find out the strategic plan, the blueprint that God had for Jesus' suffering, you realize the blueprint was really for your redemptive blessing. It's so glorious. So let's ask the Holy Spirit to help us once again because He's such a good instructor and teacher and helps unwrap it so that we can live it. Holy Spirit, help us. We just ask for your breath upon the Word of God that you would just cause it to connect with our hearts and minds, give us understanding so that we can walk this out, talk this out, we can live it out, and we can live in the center of your will and your plan for our life. I'm so thankful that Jesus sent you. We have you as our God, our helper, our teacher and instructor, and we ask humbly for your help today. Thank you, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Strategic suffering. Sounds kind of strange, doesn't it? Strategic suffering. Why should we have an awareness of Jesus? Strategic suffering. You can't truly know the name of the Lord without knowing His suffering. And we pray in the name of the Lord. So you need to know the strategic suffering of Jesus. You see, in Genesis 1, 1 the word used for God is Elohim, the plural for the Godhead. But in Genesis 2, a change is made to a specific member of the Godhead. And I think it's about 6,800 times over the, the course of the rest of the Old Testament, we hear the name of God, the singular mention of the Lord God or Yahweh, which translated means for um, those Hebrew scholars among you, these four letters, it means behold the nailed hand. So when we read in Genesis 2 on about the Lord God breathing the breath of life into Adam, we were actually saying the Lord God, we were saying Yahweh, which means behold the nailed hand, Jesus. Can you imagine? Jesus. That's why the, the Pharisees were so um, incensed and angry when Jesus said, talking about knowing Abraham, talking about the past, the history of humankind. And they were like, you're, you're a man, you're barely 30 years old. How can you know Abraham? Well, Jesus has always been. He's God. He's God. Psalm 19 verse 1, Psalm 19 verse 1 says this, The heavens are telling of the glory of God. Even the 12 constellations tell the story of the gospel of Yahweh, the Lord Jesus, as the king defeating the serpent. Look, the, behold, the hand has been strategically prophesied into our life from the very beginning of time. So let's take a look at the premeditation, the planning and strategy of the cross. God is such a planner. He strategizes. Centuries before Jesus ever walked the path to Calvary and suffered the cross, the word of God through the prophets foretold the blueprints of God's design for Jesus' suffering. It was truly God's blueprint, schematic, a tactical war strategy to deliver you and me from death and bring us life, to deliver us from the curse and give us the blessing, His amazing grace. Let's take a look at Isaiah 53, verse 10. It's a famous portion of Scripture. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise Him, talking about Jesus. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise Jesus. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. 
some translations say it was the Lord's good plan or it was God's good will to put his son to grief. God the Father counted the cost, considered you worth the price, and sanctioned this strategic suffering. He sanctioned his mercy to redeem you, to redeem me. Jesus' suffering was intentional. It was on purpose. Even every pain, every wound, every bruise, every bit of the grief and the sorrow and the depression, Jesus bore it all according to Father's will and strategy from the foundation of the world. Yes, the cross was the plan from the beginning. Revelation 13 verse 8 says this, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. It's always been God's plan. Wounded for our sin, bruised for our iniquities. You've heard that scripture before. We continue on in Isaiah 53, starting at verse 5 and 6. But he was wounded for our transgressions. Remember that word. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. And I love that cross reference because in 1 Peter 2, 24, it says again, And by Jesus' stripes we were, past tense, healed. That means Jesus paid the price. Peter was writing to the church and he's saying, By his stripes you were healed. The price has already been paid. But backing up on Isaiah 53, notice that Jesus was wounded. A wound is a cut. It's an open cut where the blood comes out into the oxygen, into the open air. Jesus was cut, bled openly. What? It says for our sin, for our transgressions, for our open disloyalty, our open um, crimes. Jesus was wounded for our sin. But then it says this, he was bruised for our iniquities. Think about this. A cut is an open bleeding, but a bruise is what? It's bleeding internally. When you bruise the skin, it's bleeding, but it's bleeding underneath of the skin, isn't it? What's interesting is that the word iniquity is not the same as the word sin or transgression. The word iniquity actually is different than sin, and it means a fault, like a fault line in geology, a crack, a weakness below the surface. Everything above may look good, but if you put enough pressure on a fault line, then boom, right? You get this sudden eruption. And the Bible says that Jesus was cut for our open sin for our transgressions, but he was bruised, he bled inwardly for our iniquity, for the faults, for the fault line underneath. You know that thing where, you know, you, you try to hold back on that anger and you try to hold back, but suddenly enough pressure in your life and you erupt and you explode into an open transgression. But the thing is that fault line was always there. You're always having to try to exercise your willpower to suppress it. Maybe it's a desire. Maybe it's a, a wicked desire on the inside, a perversion on the inside, and you're doing your best. You don't want to be condemned. You're trying to suppress it, but then a Enough pressure happens in life, enough temptation, and boom, suddenly you find yourself doing what you don't want to do. You're openly transgressing, but all the while, under the surface, that fault line was there. You can build the most beautiful home, even a castle, but if you put it on a fault line, everything can look really good until there's enough pressure on the table, on the geological table, then suddenly that whole house can be eaten by the earth. It can literally be consumed by the earth, right? If the fault line breaks open enough, the whole castle can dump into it. And that's the way some people's lives feel. Just the right amount of pressure and what's under the surface, suddenly there's a disaster. People are like, well, I didn't see that coming. Well, I didn't know Mary would do that. I didn't know that John would do that. I can't believe Stephen did that. The fault line. Jesus was cut for our open sin. But Jesus was bruised, bruised. He bled inwardly for our iniquity. Oh, my goodness. Doesn't it excite you to think about the strategy that God intended for his only begotten son to suffer so that you and I might be redeemed from all this stuff? But you see, until you know it, you can't have it. You can't possess. You can't activate something that you have no knowledge of. You feel like you've got control of that anger, but then suddenly, right? 
Jesus bore the crown of thorns. See, why? That's, that was a specific intentional suffering Jesus bore. Why did he bear the crown of thorns? We know it was intentional suffering. So why? Psalm 8 verse 5 says that we were meant to wear a crown of honor and glory. Jesus wore the crown, symbolic of the curse, to get you and me back the crown of honor and glory, that we might be the sons and daughters of the Most High God. Jesus' hands were pierced. Why? To redeem the works of your hands back from the curse. Jesus' feet were pierced. Why? So that He could redeem back the path of life that you could walk, that you would have permission to walk the path of life and never have to leave it again. My friend, you honor the king when you appropriate every benefit by faith that Jesus paid full price for. So I want to take you to a portion of scripture that has been so wrongly interpreted in the past by people in the church. It's called pick up your cross and follow Jesus. Now, before you tune me out, listen to this. I'm going to bring it back to the context that Jesus intended it to be in. So this isn't going to be uh, a religious exercise. You're going to enjoy this. Come on with me for a second. Matthew 16, verse 24. Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to be my disciple, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. You know, I've, I've been in churches. I remember being in this church in Florida, and I won't mention their name, but Pam and I were doing ministry in this church in Florida, and the pastor got up, and he, and he said that verse with such an angry, fist-pounding. He was like, you got to deny yourself. you got to take up your cross. I mean, it was, it was even scaring me. It was just so awful. But that's not how Jesus said it. Jesus was saying it this way. It's like he's saying, you get to deny your cursed self. You get to be free from your destructive, cursed, broken, fault line self. You get to pick up your cross, associate with me and follow me. You get to do this. I've heard so many people use this command with the wrong tone, erroneously, abusively, and just flat out wrong. So here's a few things that you've got to know about the context to understand what Jesus is saying. First of all, just before that, Peter had rebuked Jesus for even thinking about suffering and dying on the cross. Imagine that. Peter the apostle telling Jesus, oh no, you're not going to die on the cross. No, you're not going to do this. And you remember Jesus had to turn his back on Peter and say, get thee behind me, Satan. You don't savor the plans of God. God had a strategic plan. So Peter got nailed for that one. Remember Galatians 3, 13, cursed is everyone who hangs on the cross. So to the disciples, when they heard Jesus saying, yeah, I'm going to have to die on the cross for you guys. They were like, oh my goodness, a Jewish man hanging on the cross, becoming a curse. Oh, God forbid, Jesus, you can't do that. Us Jews, we, if you're going to die, die some other way, but not hanging on a tree. You see, this was abhorrent for any Jew to even imagine a king savior dying on the cross. It was against their law. But Jesus came to fulfill the law by paying the price for you and me. The ancient Hebrew letter Tav looks exactly like a cross. And it means the sign of the covenant. Jesus came to give us the sign of the covenant. So when he was talking to them about associating with the cross, with his cross, he was saying, I want you to associate, buy into my new covenant, the better covenant. The Hebrew word for covenant is brit, and it means the cross of my son. Coincidentally, right? Isn't that beautiful? Jesus was telling Peter and his disciples, not only are you going to have to be good with me dying this way on the cross, but you're going to have to associate with me dying on the cross and pick up the sign of my cross to believe in me. It's all about the cross, he was telling them. To be my disciple, you're going to have to associate with this price I pay at the cross. And so you're going to have to deny your way of thinking, your old sins. You're going to have to deny all the stuff in your life that doesn't work and become a shareholder in my victory at the cross. But see, they couldn't see it as a victory at that point. It was hard for them to look past their Jewish customs. Jesus had to be cursed for you to be blessed. To pick up your sign of the covenant, you have to agree with these terms. His death on the cross buys your freedom. It came at a high price. 
Beloved of God, you could die a million deaths on a cross and never accomplish an iota of what Jesus did perfectly, strategically, fully. Did you hear that? Your suffering cannot add to the completed full work of God through Jesus at the cross. That means, that means Jesus said when he said it's finished, he meant you cannot add to his perfect sacrifice, his redemptive work at the cross with any other suffering. I, I get frustrated sometimes when I hear people even in the ministry, other pastors and missionaries start talking about their suffering. Your suffering, the only time Paul ever did that was when he said, look, he says, I'm going to talk like a fool right now. You know, I, I had this done to me and I suffered this. And he said, remember, I'm talking like a fool. Fool. That's the only time we wouldn't even know what Paul had suffered, except that he said, I'm going to about to talk like a crazy fool. Because why? It's all about the cross of Jesus. Jesus finished the work. Our suffering cannot add anything to his work at the cross. The whole book of Galatians from Paul is basically the apostle calling the people stupid and ignorant for thinking that they could add to the work of cross. You cannot add to Jesus' work. It's perfect. It's flawless. It's wonderful. So what does Jesus command us to do in picking up our cross and following him? What does that really mean? Well, we go back to his last supper, Mark 14, verse 24, and he said this, This is my blood, the new covenant, which is shed for many. It's where you come to love the mark of his sign. Right? We love the cross. It's the new agreement. It's where we say our best is never good enough. I need Jesus' work at the cross. That's what associating with the cross means. It's where you say my worst is never so bad that his work on the cross can't save me. It's where you stop being me-minded and you become totally it's all about Jesus-minded. It's where you stop condemning yourself and stop praising yourself. There's ditches on both sides of that, but both of them are wrong. It's where it becomes all about Jesus. It's where you stop saying that you're not worthy and you start saying, because Jesus is worthy, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. For some of you, that's a difficult thing to say, but you have to pick up your cross, deny your old self and recognize your reborn self through the wounds of Jesus. That's associating with his cross. That's picking up your cross and following Jesus. It's where you stop allowing your suffering to compete with his suffering. Stop talking about what you're enduring. Talk about what Jesus has already accomplished and bought for you. Picking up your cross is to completely associate with and believe on His work. You get to deny your broke-down, sin-filled, cursed self. I'm so thankful for that. I get to deny my old, broke-down, sin-filled, cursed self. Anytime I, I pray and the enemy comes along and says, Stephen, you don't have a right to pray for that. That's too good. You can't pray for those kind of blessings. Right away, I just say, I plead the blood of Jesus. And I know that Jesus did such a good work at the cross. I get what Jesus deserves. Oh my goodness. That's just so glorious to come to that truth and recognize it. That is picking up your cross, denying yourself and following Jesus. All the things of the old nature that are curse prone, selfishness, ugliness, I get to deny, let go of, I drop at the cross. And you, you yourself, you get to receive all of his benefits and advantages at the cross. Picking up our cross is activating his cross and his victory in our life. Ceasing from relying on my strength. Crucifying your flesh is basically letting go of your old cursed nature at the foot of the cross and saying, Lord... I identify with the success of your actions on the cross. My hope is in your championship at the cross. From here on out, my actions will reflect my confidence in what you have done and accomplished at the cross. Now that's strategic suffering, all that Jesus paid for. You know, I've given people gift cards before. And I have to tell you, I enjoy blessing people. I enjoy giving people gifts, especially when I know what that person really wants and even what they need maybe. So... Sometimes I feel like a gift card is exactly the right thing for that special person. But do you know what I find 
unsatisfactory, disappointing, maybe even frustrating, is when I go online two years later and find out that the gift has not been redeemed. I'm like, are you kidding me? I gave that to you two years, two years ago, and you still are not enjoying the benefits of that gift. But you see, that's the thing about a gift. Once it's given, it's out of your authority to manage. At least it should be. <laughs> it should be. God does not give and take away. That's outside of his character. He doesn't do that. Even if you fail to appropriate the gift, you've got full manage, management of the rights. You have to apply the benefits. He's not going to interfere. Even if he can see that you really need to redeem the gift he gave you, he gave you that right to say yes or no. Well, now, Pastor Stephen, if it really was God's will, he would just make it happen. What? That's not in the Bible. That's not in the good book. My dear friend, by grace you have been saved through faith, that it might be the gift of God. That's what Ephesians 2.8 says. But once again, a gift has to be received and activated to be used. If someone gives you a $100 gift card to your favorite store, and ignorance is not an excuse to miss out on enjoying those benefits, so why do we think spiritual ignorance is okay? Hebrews 2 verse 3 says this, How can we be saved if we neglect so great a salvation? How can we be saved if we neglect to appropriate the benefits of the cross? Dear friend, I can just tell you from what Jesus suffered at the cross, I want to walk you through this. Can I explain some of the benefits at the cross? Just a few I just want you to, I want to remind you of what he's already paid for, for your life. Jesus bore our disloyalty at the Last Supper. When Jesus' best friend Judas walked out on him and betrayed him, Jesus took our disloyalty, our betrayal. He knows what it's like. When he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, he suffered the crushing anxiety and the depression, the sorrow. Jesus bled such great drops of blood from his brow. Even Luke, the doctor, the physician, talks about that, how that his capillaries broke and the vessels broke with such anxiety and the blood poured down his brow. Can you imagine carrying the anxiety and the depression and the sorrow for all of humanity? What a crushing weight. Jesus didn't run from death. He went after death intentionally. He made war on death by chasing it down. Jesus defeated death. We are appointed to die. We were appointed to die. And Jesus, the king, showed up and took our appointment so that as king of kings, he might appoint us to life, to his benefits. With every step toward the cross, Jesus redeemed your worth, the genius of your design. Isaiah 50 says, He didn't hide His face from the shame or the spitting. He took our shame and humiliation. Jesus honored us when He suffered in the garden to deliver us from fear and anxiety. Jesus honored you when He suffered the stripes on His back at the whipping post for your healing to be free from every disease. Psalm 103 says that He has healed every one of our diseases by those stripes. He gives no honor to sickness. Jesus doesn't honor disease. He doesn't honor depression or addiction. He destroys that stuff. Jesus redeemed you and me when they pierced his feet to redeem a path of victory for our lives. He redeemed you and me when he opened up his hands to the nails willingly that pierced him so that he might redeem the assignment of the works of your hands at the cross that you might have success in Christ Jesus. Jesus honored me and you when they put the crown of thorns on his brow to get us back the crown of glory and honor. He doesn't give any honor to shame and pain. He crushes it with his bruises. Jesus honors you and me with his pierced side when he restored the order of our relationships, grafting you into his own precious family. He doesn't honor brokenness and separation, but he does weigh heavy your tears, my friend. When you cry, he weighs heavy the tears, the sorrow that you feel. At his cross, Jesus gives you beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for sorrow. Jesus redeemed you when he died and went into the grave and descended into hell, dispossessed the devil of the keys of death, hell, and the grave. Jesus does not weigh death heavy. 
No, no, he mocks death. Jesus has destroyed hell's power over our lives. King Jesus honors the Father in you in the same breath when he ascended to the throne of heaven to reign on high and intercede for you and me night and day. Jesus weighs your worth priceless worth more than all the gold and the silver in the world. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah, and he is roaring freedom for you, blessing on you. The king of kings appoints life for you, family, his awesome family for you. Today is the day of salvation. You have an appointment arranged by the king of all kings, and it's today, right now. You should be thinking, what will I do with this truth? What can I do with this truth? Why am I waiting for? The people who crucified Jesus after the resurrection, they asked Peter, what shall we do now that we know the truth? And Acts 2 verse 38 says this, Peter said, repent, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. Repent just means change your way of thinking. Quit thinking religious thoughts. Start thinking Jesus thoughts. Quit thinking worldly. Set your mind on Jesus. Quit thinking political thoughts. Think the kingdom of God. Quit thinking independent, autonomous thoughts, but trust in God, the Savior, the King of all kings. What lie have you believed so strongly that it would keep you from believing the truth of God's word? Every one of those things, just lay them down at the foot of the cross and simply pray this beautiful prayer with me right now. It's a miracle prayer, not because the words by themselves are so powerful, but your faith, the faith in your heart to believe in what the Lord has just said to you, that faith connecting with these words. Remember what we said in Revelation? How do they overcome? By the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. Pray this prayer out loud, right where you're at. Dear Lord Jesus, I come to the cross Forgive me of all my sin. I plead your blood. You died in my place. I accept your redemption. You defeated every charge against me. Come into my heart. Be the Lord of my life. Be the King of my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Help me to live for you. In your precious name, amen.